Good evening, everyone. How are you on this? Is it balmy outside? I haven't been out. I was going to say balmy Tuesday night, but I haven't seen the weather today. So, uh, My name is Scott Dodson. Thank you for coming. I'm the executive director of the Library of Virginia Foundation. Uh, we appreciate that you were able to join us this evening. Um, just a couple notes before we start tonight's program. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Library of Virginia is the Commonwealth's oldest institution dedicated to the preservation of Virginia's history and culture. Uh, we're celebrating our 200th anniversary this year, th so thank you for being a part of that. It opened in 1823. Um, we reach approximately 4 million people every year through our um, websites and our web properties and reach about 100,000 people coming through our doors every year. So. Um, it's really a tremendous institution. I encourage everyone to check out the library's website at lva.virginia.gov. There are over 130 million items in our collection, so I'm sure that there's something in there that, that would resonate with everybody in this room. Um, there will also be a book signing in the lobby after tonight's program, as well as a Q&A at the end of, of their discussion. Um, so we have some mics on the sides. A couple of us will walk around with them and find you in the room, or you're welcome to come up to the podium. Um, before we begin, and before we welcome BK up to the stage, I'd like to introduce Holly Bird Miller, who will be interviewing BK this evening for this program. Um, Holly is founder and CEO of Makeup by Holly Beauty Partners, an award-winning SWAM certified talent management agency that specializes in personal branding, corporate image consulting, and bridal. She currently leads and mentors a nationwide team of professionals, hairstylists, makeup artists, wardrobe stylists, videographers, photographers, and brand strategists. That is a lot of hats. Um, she serves on the board of directors for Girls for Change, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to prepare black girls for the world, the world of black girls. She works with Primus Bank on the Primus Works program, providing on-the-job training to single mothers. And she provides beauty services for countless nonprofit organizations, including the American Heart Association, Safe Harbor, Down Syndrome Association, YWCA, and Forward Foundation. Um, she is also the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Lipstick and Legacies, which details the personal and professional journeys of six successful female entrepreneurs representing six diverse business sectors. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, Holly Bird Miller uh, to introduce tonight's author. So, Holly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. It's so great to see all of your lovely faces. So I'm not gonna make this about me. This is about the man that you came to, came to see, Mr. BK Fulton. So let's get into all of the wonderful accolades that this man has accomplished, and we're gonna get into the book, his latest release. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about my friend and my mentor, Mr. B.K. Fulton. B.K. is a native of Virginia, and I was just sharing with him back, backstage that I'm so glad that we didn't lose him to a bigger market because he could very easily live anywhere he wanted to, but he chose Virginia as home, and we're so proud of that. He is the former president of a little company you may know named Verizon. He is the chairman of not one, not two, but seven companies. You can say he's a little bit of an overachiever. <laughs> he's a graduate of Virginia Tech. He earned a Master of Science degree and Sloan Fellowship from Harvard and a Juris Doctorate from New York Law School. He is married to the beautiful Jackie Stone right here on the front row. She's a prominent attorney at McGuire Woods Law Firm. BK founded Solidify Productions in 2017. It's a film, stage, and TV investment company. He's produced 15 feature films. He released two number one shows on Broadway and received two Tony nominations. The Piano Lesson is now the highest grossing Broadway revival of all time. It's, it literally made history. And just this year alone, if that wasn't enough, he's releasing four films, including The Kill Room with Uma Thurman and Samuel L. Jackson. He's reviving The Wiz of Oz for a 20-week national run and a 20-week Broadway run. He's launched a new movie company in April it's called Movie Pass with MasterCard. 
that has already over 150,000 subscribers. He's hosting a black tie gala with ABC's Deborah Roberts to honor the Virginia woman who invented GPS, Dr. Gladys West. And he's released his 16th book, The Blueprint, which reached number one in the performing arts division. Wow, what an inspiration, what an inspiration. So you've heard me talk about the films, you've heard me talk about movie pass, you've heard me talk about Broadway, and a lot of other amazing accolades and accomplishments. But here's something that you may not know about BK. BK continues to mentor folks like myself and countless others. He invests and he consults for other business owners. And here's one in his own words. There was a book that was released in January of this year, and the title of the book is called Black Founder. And the author's name is Stacy Spikes. And in Stacy's words, in early 2019, I got a call from my dear friend BK Fulton. He said he was coming to town and wanted to know if I was available to grab drinks. I said, absolutely, because I always love chatting with BK. He had been an executive at Verizon for years and was at one point interested in investing in a movie pass, but was late to the round. I had met BK at the BFF Summit, and over the years, we got to know each other pretty well. He's just one of those positive brothers you always feel great after spending some time with. We met in the hotel he was staying at near, Ground Central, near Grand Central. He was dressed as sharply as always. He sat in two deep chairs with a black glass table between overlooking the atrium. He asked how my family was and I asked about his wife, Jackie. He then jumped right into it and wanted to know what the hell was all this crazy BS in the press about movie pass. He was referring to the constant insanity that was happening on a weekly basis. I filled him in on some of the craziest stories and we laughed about how unbelievable it really was. Then his demeanor changed and he looked me in the eyes and said, man, I'm really sorry about what happened. You and Hammett worked hard to build that company and we were all so proud of you guys. I'm sorry, man, that just isn't right. I got a lump in my throat and I had to look away. I thanked him for his kind words. Then in true BK fashion, he turned the mood around and said, the real question is, what are you working on now? Because you know that you can't keep a good brother down. I told him about my ideas around pre-show and being able to put the power of people's attention into their own hands. He loved it and always encouraging, ask about my next steps. I said, I believe there was a way to get a patent on the technology and he asked how much it would cost to get there. I threw out a rough estimate and without hesitation he said, if it's all right with you, Jackie and I would like to invest. I was speechless. The money would certainly help immensely, but I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't pitching BK. It was just two old friends catching up. I didn't know what to say. BK leaned across the table and said, brother, we have to make sure that you get back in the ring. You need to continue building great things. I'm sorry about what happened to you, but we're not gonna let them win. We have to stick together. And if we don't come together and support you at times like this, then who will? This is, a, this is Wakanda, baby. And we got your back. Wakanda forever, brother. I will wire you the money next week just send me the instructions. There have been times in my life when human beings completely astounded me, and this was one of those times. True to his word, BK wired the funds a week later. Wow, I get chills just hearing, I get chills just hearing about that. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Mr. BK Fulton. quite a bit and I am so honored to be able to again interview my mentor 
my friend, Mr. DK Fulton. We're gonna talk about a lot of things. He doesn't even know what we're gonna talk about. I didn't even give him the questions in advance, so he's gonna probably be just as surprised as you all are, so hopefully he won't be like, uh -oh. hugging me and kicking me. <laughs> but I really wanted to take the opportunity to just have a conversation with my friend. Hopefully there'll be some information that will be valuable to you all. We really wanna hear from you all at some point as well. So be getting your questions ready. Um, so when I was looking through all of your accolades, I was reading the book that we're going to get into a little bit later. I literally was highlighting like every, every other sentence. There was so many profound moments, so much information, so many nuggets, and so many gems. But I know this isn't the first book for you. You've written 15 other books prior to this, and I just learned tonight you probably have four or five more in the pipeline. That's so. true. So you're definitely ambitious and not slowing down anytime soon. But I'd like to ask you, when did you start writing books and how did you choose the first topic? The first book uh, that was published was Shauna. And it was about my little sister um, who has Rett syndrome. And it's on the autism spectrum. Only girl children survive it. So it speaks to the... Uh, strength of women and your likely superiority as this dominance in our species. But be that as it may, um, I was the alpha male, I was the older brother, and it was my job to look out for Shauna um, until my parents got home from work and then I could go play ball or whatever. And Shauna couldn't walk or talk, but um, she would communicate if you paid attention. And so she would make a certain sound when she was hungry or a certain movement if she needed to go to the restroom. And if you paid attention, you would appreciate what she needed. I had no idea that that experience of providing care would pay dividends later well, throughout my life, but especially as I entered environments where I had to judge people or judge situations. I had this mother wit that I think came from you know, looking out for my sister that helped me. Um, I decided to publish that book first when I retired from running Verizon because my lovely wife said that I should publish the poem and have it illustrated as a book um, because it would bless people, it would move people. It was something I did when I was 16, uh, the poem, to try to understand what it might be like to be her. I thought somehow maybe I zapped her energy because I could do all these things and she had all these challenges. Um, you know, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is expected, and I, I, I totally believe that. But as a child, I thought the much was a particular thing. You know, your gift with your business, you know, a person's gift in law or photography or what have you. What I learned was that the gift was actually life itself. Mm. And if you woke up, you're on the hook. Old or young, white or black, whatever ethnicity, whatever persuasion, fully capable or with some challenges. If you woke up, you're on the hook. And you've been given the great thing, the much, is life. And what you do with it is your gift back. And so when I was 16, I wrote this. And it became a book called Shauna when I was 50. And illustrated by Jerry Craft with a, a cover quote on the back by Nikki Giovanni who was my poetry professor at uh, Virginia Tech. Um, but the book, the whole book goes like this. A gazing little boy stopped and asked, can you run? Yes, adjusting her leg brace. Can you dance? Yes, adjusting her position in her wheelchair. Are you happy? Yes, adjusting her gaze towards heaven. Big brother, now that you are a man, in your newfound wisdom, don't count me out. I run in my mind. I am an Olympian. I dance in my dreams. I am a debutante. And I am happy 
because I am alive. Yeah, right. <laughs> Gosh, if, if that doesn't inspire us all, I don't know what does, honestly. <laughs> and so I know that was one of many children's books that you have written. Can you tell me why you've decided to also focus on children's books? What importance that has to you? Sure. Um, I think we're probably 11, 12 children's books. Uh, I wrote that book, and then... My wife also had an idea that I should talk about my childhood. And so I had a fun childhood growing up between Hampton and Virginia, Newport News. Both my parents are educators. Um, and I started looking at how I might give back to community, especially young people. I figured that if I could help young people to really believe in themselves, and, and young people of any kind, um, that they would grow up and do marvelous things in the world. And, um, and so I decided to write these books. I did a little research, and I found that if you were a, a black or brown child, you were more likely to see a cat, a dog, or a humanoid on the cover of a book than someone that looked like you. And originally, I was like, well, we're in a, trying to be a colorblind society. Why does that matter? Mm -hmm. And so I talked to some folk at University of Pennsylvania, and they have the number one graduate school of education in the, in the country, probably in the world. And what they showed me was the statistics on the significance of iconography and images. And they said that if a child sees an image that looks like him or her, on the cover of a book or inside the pages of a book, they are three to 10 times more likely to believe that they can do what the character does. So it begins to set in motion what you think of yourself. Um, in life, human beings, ex are, you know, to try to simplify it, we experience mirrors and windows. Mirrors are how you see yourself reflected on TV and media and the things you read. Windows are how you look through somebody else's life. What is interesting is the mirrors are particularly important, especially when you're young. And if you see yourself and doing things, creating things, you develop a healthy sense of who you are and what you can be. You develop a great sense of where you fit in the world. And you're less likely to have imposter syndrome if you get into a place and you're the only one there that looks like you. The other thing that's beautiful about having sufficient mirrors is the confidence that comes with that allows you to appreciate windows, looking through someone else's lens, someone else's life, and appreciating what they have done. And because you are a part of the human family, you decide that you can do that too. So it doesn't take away, it's additive. And that's, you know, when I read that, I related to it because that's what happened to me. So the guy that you just read about, I'm listening to this stuff, I'm like, wow, I hope he shows up tonight. <laughs> because I was flunking out of college. Um, I was at Virginia Tech in engineering. Virginia Tech was the first school in the world to require incoming engineers to buy computers as part of their standard school supply. So I was in that group of kids you know, in the early 80s. And um, it was just a new world for me. It was a lot of basketball courts, beautiful people to hang out with. It was cold in the winter, so I didn't like the cold, so I might not have gone to class as much as I should have. <laughs> so that is not a formula for doing well. And uh, I was flunking out, and I started getting these letters from the registrar's office that you, um, you're you not going to be able to stay here much longer with those kind of grades. So I said, all right, what's the easiest major on campus? And I assumed it was going to be sociology. So I went to the dean of sociology and said, I think I'm going to transfer out of engineering to sociology. He looked at my grades. He said, well, college ain't for everybody. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, oh, he said, you might want to join the Army. <laughs> and so I went to the Christiansburg Armory and signed up. 
And, um, but I did one other thing that I'm thankful for, and I feel like this is part of the divine part of my life. And God's always been there, but this is looking back when I knew it was special. So I went to the library to plan my escape from Virginia Tech. And it's a giant library, and I ended up in the E-185 section. And in any Dewey Decimal System in the country, the E-185 section happens to be the section on black people. So I go in there, and I'm in this section, and I'm seeing these kind of images I've never seen before. And I grab this one book on this guy named Lewis Latimer. I was like, Ooh, who's this guy? He's got a book about him. And I open it up, and you find out that his family's from Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. And he's only the guy that invented the part of the light that glows. I'm like, what? He looks like me? Lights? I read further, the very first book in the world on incandescence was written by Lewis Latimer. Mm. The projects to light New York, Montreal, London, and Philadelphia, all headed by Lewis Latimer. He's the only African-American scientist that was on the um, scientific committee with Edison. And recently, in the last you know, four years, I joined his board because I feel like I, I owe a debt to Lewis Latimer. Other books that I came across, Granville T. Woods invented the third rail and sold the patent to General Electric um, in um, 1901. Um, Garrett Morgan invented the stoplight, sold the patent to General Electric for 40 grand. And so I'm reading about all these people that I never heard about. And first I got angry because I felt like some woman had hidden important and vital information from me. So I brought it up in a class, and we were talking about the light bulb. I raised my hand, and I said, well, he talked about Thomas Edison and the light bulb. I said, well, what about Louis Latimer? He was like, who's Louis Latimer? And I told him what I had learned. And what I realized was he hadn't learned it either because mm. nobody told him. So it wasn't that he was racist. He didn't know. And so he said, all right, well, I'll look it up. And if it's what you say and sounds like it is, you've got citations and everything, I'll add it to the lecture. So then I realized, OK, people of goodwill can be trained, can learn more. I went from the probations list to the dean's list to the board of directors at Virginia Tech, where they're flying me in a jet to govern the school. And that was the kind of awakening that I wanted to create for everyone. Mm. Because I believe to my core that when each of us brings the best version of ourselves, it resolves in love. And that love accelerates the cure for cancer, accelerates the cure for ALS, accelerates us fixing the problems that we experience. But without that love, people will govern out of fear, fear of being replaced, fear of someone taking their job, fear of someone coming into their community that is unwelcome or unwanted. And if you don't have a lived experience or a trusted set of people sharing information about this thing you're scared of, the other, then you will assess it based on your stereotype as opposed to actual lived experience or knowledge or informed perspective. So that's why most thinkers would agree that prejudice and ignorance are tightly correlated. And then as you broaden your horizons, stretch your mind, stretch your ideas, spend time with other people, your attitude about those people shifts. I'm reading this wonderful book now about Justice Harlan, who is considered the great dissenter um, on the you know, early Supreme Courts. And his dissents, I mean, often he was the only dissenter when the court, at a time where the court rarely dissented. And his policies, his dissents, have largely been codified into law. So he was very prescient. He was before his time. And he had a favorable point of view about inter-ethnic cooperation. 
And then what you find out in the book is that his, he had a black half-brother. And so he got to know a different experience than maybe some of his, some of the other judges did. And that played out in his policy, in his dissent, in his writings. And so I just love reading. I'm reading a book also, I just finished one about Albert Einstein. And some of his most beautiful writings were about love and art and the silliness of judging people. And, um, and so uh, for me, writing and sharing those things became a part of what I decided I should do with my life. Mm -hmm. I tell people I'm in alignment with my assignment. In fact, the first quote in the book is, uh, let me see if I can remember it, um, our greatest achievements lie on the other side of our fears. My prayer for you is that you love yourself enough to give your dreams a chance. Mm. Wow, powerful. I, I love that you segued into that because when I was reading the book, of course you had a really successful career with Verizon and you retired at 50. Most people couldn't even imagine retiring at the age of 50, right? And, and you said something along the lines of you, and you could probably say it best about when you retired and how you were doing the job that you were maybe trained to do and after you retired, now you're doing what you were designed to do or something along those lines, but I want you to clean that up and I want you to talk a little bit more about that because that really spoke to me. So now you're in a space where, as you alluded to previously, you're doing the work that you're designed to do and you really feel that you were called to do. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, that's fair. What I said was I spent my first 50 years doing what I was trained to do and now I get to spend the rest of my life doing what God made me to do. Yeah. And that's to tell these stories, to try to lift people. Um, it's not new to be a person that supports uplift. Um, if you look at the history of our country, there's this rich shared narrative of allies and excellence. We don't get to be here in this room together in this configuration without a lot of good people from many different communities saying, let us band together and do the right thing. That's how this happens. And so whenever we get a little worried about what's happening in politics or what's happening in some communities, we have to remember that we have come a long ways. And together, we can go forward. And um, that's not lost on me. Uh, when I retired at actually 49 years, 348 days, can you, t can you tell I'm an engineer? I mean, kind of pr precision matters. Um, I wasn't sure what I would be doing next until I started thinking about the young people I wanted to impact. And uh, a light bulb went off and that you know, these young people are on video games, they're on phones, they're growing up kind of you know, generation of internet citizens. And if I could do what was done for me, take what those books did for me, if I could put that on the big screen and tell powerful stories with great music and great acting and great cinematography, I could help to ignite the, the best in people. And so that's what I've tried to do. Um, and um, I'm having fun doing it. I didn't know how much fun it was going to be. I mean, you know, you know, two Tony nominations, Broadway. Uh, I just finished writing a musical that'll be on Broadway in 2025 called From August with Love. Um, we just finished a, a new movie script called The Something That Comes From Nothing. And it's a commentary on aging out of the foster care system but also this really talented person, but because he's from the wrong side of the tracks, nobody believes that he can do what he's, draw these beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. And then, I won't, I won't ruin the story for you, but hopefully that'll be in theaters at some point. But this stuff just kind of comes to my head. Mm -hmm. And I wake up and um, I'll start writing. Uh, Nikki Giovanni taught me to keep a notepad by my bed to capture the idea and now, does anybody use Alexa? So now I, 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 will, I will tell Alexa, 
Uh, I'll leave post-it notes at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to trigger the idea so I can go back and write about it. Um, and uh, we've gotten a great reaction from, um, from the community, from the people that see our art. I hope they see the love that we put into it. Um, when, I, when you talk about the stuff we're doing this year, I mean, four films in one year is hard. Um, but I feel like I've got to work at this pace because the ideas are coming and I want to try to get them all out. And I feel like I can help. And so, you know, when you figure out what you're supposed to do, you, you try to do it when you can. <laughs> I concur. I believe that when you are in alignment with your design assignment, the opportunities will come, the people that you need to surround yourself will come like yourself, and you're unstoppable. And so, um, again, very, very inspiring. And I, I always say that Richmond has so many amazing people who are doing amazing things. And so when I was preparing to come here to talk to you, I was like, BK is one of the most inspirational people I know. I was like, I don't need to go to the Chicago's and the New York's to meet the Oprah's and the Tony Robbins. We have BK Fulton, we have people like you uh. right here, so. <laughs> so thank you for all that you do for Richmond and well beyond Richmond. You're truly, truly inspiring. So I wanted to continue to go down the path of like, what we're really here to talk about, right? We're here to talk about your latest book, your 16th book, and it's called The Blueprint. And I, I was sharing with BK, I stayed up one night till like three o'clock in the morning because I could not put this book down. It is that good. For all of you who haven't read it, please buy it before you leave tonight. It's amazing. It's very, very inspiring. And so in the book, you talk, um, it's kind of a collection, right, of your of other entrepreneurs and people who are pioneers and doing remarkable works like yourself throughout, throughout the world and even you know, throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, one thing I want to focus in on a little bit is the, the entrepreneurs that you highlight because there were countless people who were um, noted in the book and um, myself being one, so I'm very honored about that. Thank you so much. But there's so many other amazing people here and beyond that you highlight in the book and you talk about their entrepreneurial journey. And then also you have this collection of really amazing speeches that you wrote. And one speech that you wrote that really resonated with me in the book is, uh, it was a speech that you wrote um, for a, um, an address that you did for the Metropolitan Business League. And that is a really amazing organization here in, in Richmond that supports entrepreneurs and prepares that them. That your husband runs. <laughs> that he does, but beyond that, it's a, just a remarkable organization. And so how many people in the room, by show of hands, are entrepreneurs? All right, perfect. And then do we have any creatives in the room, by show of hands? Perfect, so we got the room covered. I think we got the, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna address my next questions from either end, either perspective, right, because I don't wanna leave anybody out. So from the perspective of an entrepreneur and creatives, what do you think is the, is the secret sauce? Because you obviously have it. You're dripping in it. So what is the secret sauce? <laughs> wow. Um, I think loving what you do helps a lot mm -hmm. because then it doesn't really feel like work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I enjoy what I do. It's not easy per se, but because I enjoy it, I don't mind, mm -hmm. and it's fun, and I love the outcomes enough mm -hmm. that I do the work. Um, I think probably the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs face is getting the capital, the money, to see their vision come to reality. I, when I was working in the nonprofit sector, what I used to hate was we'd come up with these great programs, and then we've got to convince somebody who couldn't care less sometimes that our idea had merit or that they should fund it and that they should be kind or whatever. And I said to myself, if I can ever get out of this begging people for money, I'm going to do it. And, um, and so you know, solving a real problem becomes another important thing for entrepreneurs. So if, you're, if you love it, you have capital, and you're solving a real problem, you can usually create a sustainable business. Um, there are some things that people should probably pass on. 
Um, not every idea is a you know, billion dollar business. Um, but as you said, you can be from right here in Richmond, mm -hmm. Virginia, and have a brilliant idea and, 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 and impact the world. I mean, our films are shown all over the world. Um, one of the biggest questions, or one, of the, one of the questions I get most frequently is, well, don't you have to move to Los Angeles or New York? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that might have been true 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but the modern film industry is largely you know, capturing pictures wherever the location is, and then a lot of what's called you know, post-production, where people are in different places all over the world using high-speed internet and, and fancy computers. And so you can be anywhere. And then we have these things called airplanes, and um, I happen to be on the airport commission, so if you've had a good experience at the airport lately, <laughs> you know, we're doing our job. And so we can get to wherever we want to get to easily. And Richmond is such a cool place to live. It's a medium-sized city, but we've got the great attributes, restaurants, the river, great people. And, uh, and so I figured that if I'm going to do this labor of love um, that's about creative output, I needed to do it from a place that felt like home. Mm. And Richmond feels like home for me. Again, we are so happy that you're here and you haven't moved to those bigger markets because we need more BKs. We need more BKs of the world. We need people like you to continue to inspire us and encourage us and just continue to pour into your community. So again, thank you so much. Um, so my next question, again, kind of going down that entrepreneurial or creative track, can you talk, so we're coming out of COVID, right? I know that's a word a lot of people don't like to still use, but you know we can't forget that we had three really trying years coming out of COVID. Now that we're back to business, we're back to life, we're back to kind of doing our things. What would you say is like one of the ways in which maybe you pivoted during that pandemic and or how would entrepreneurs, how could entrepreneurs even like position themselves so that if there's another, you know, natural disaster, some world, you know, um, disaster that we could still kind of rise above that and still um, thrive. So do you have any guidance in that regard? Uh, sure. I mean, I can talk from my perspective mm -hmm. and, and speculate about the, the doom that may come, but hopefully we won't see that. Um, for us, so we started the film company in 2017, and the film business, you know, one of the revenue streams is people going to theaters. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, COVID shut that down. Um, but what was good for us was, you know, timing's everything, right? So we exist at a time where there are a lot of streaming services, so you don't have to go out. You can, you know, so we digitized stuff and did releases that included theater when they were open, and if they weren't open, streaming and on demand. Um, in 2017, when we started filming, we could get enough product so by the time the pandemic hit, we already were done filming. You know, we had um, completed what's called principal photography. And so it's kind of in the can. So then we were in post-production, which is done largely computers and internet. So it would, it, no same space, same time was not required. And so, and then when I was writing the children's books in the same year, um, I was just sitting at a desk, so away from people, and my publisher was in Pennsylvania, the illustrator was in another state, and so we're just emailing files back and forth. So again, not so impacted. Um, and I, I do think a little bit of it was divine timing. Um, my mission was just and righteous, and I felt like I was doing it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. and so the universe was cooperating because I knew a lot of friends who got into the business after we did and they had to shut down productions. Mm. I was in a place where we had already finished production and so then we just edited and released things. Uh, same thing happened recently with this film, the, the Kill Room with Uma Thurman and Samuel Jackson. So when the writers went on strike, so not as bad as COVID, but the, you know, the, the writers and the, the actors, um, we had already done all the filming. Mm -hmm. So, 
when they walked off the sets or walked off the premieres, it didn't really affect us. In fact, because we had a finished product, there was a bidding war mm. for the film at the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> so we, you know, got, you know, some people would say lucky, I'd say blessed. And, um, and so that's been my story. It, 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 we tend to, you know, land on our feet. Uh, for the entrepreneurs that are thinking about those kinds of things for their own business, I think you, know, you, you, you prepare for the worst, so you have, uh, you, you have meetings about uh, the, the potential threats to your business mm -hmm. so that you're aware of them, but you should also always um, work for what you're seeking. I think people make a mistake if they uh, let the worst of their experience define their whole existence. If they start running their business because they're afraid something bad may happen, um, it creates a problem. And often what I found in the world is that what you seek is seeking you. Mm. And if you're looking for trouble, if you're looking for the bad thing, uh, whether it's in relationships or business, you're going to find it. Um, that's one of the things, when I became the first African-American president of the phone company here, you know, I said, well, I'll be the first, but I won't be the last. And people said, well, what about bias? What about racism? I mean, my first CEO job was in West Virginia. And I was a little nervous if you listen to all the chatter. But when I got there, it was salt of the earth. They were wonderful people. They supported me. Um, there's a funny little story I tell sometimes. I'll share it here. We, we got a little time. Okay. Yeah, um, so I lived on this hill overlooking a golf course in West Virginia, and um, my twin boys and I were at a school doing kind of a show and tell. I was the guest speaker, and it was fun to have the president of the phone company in. And I brought all the other, brought an old phone from the 1900s. I had a cell phone, and I'm showing them the difference. And I told them how important it was to use the tools of your time. And it starts snowing. So I'm like, okay, it should be fine. And I, I lived on this big hill, remember. And near the house was this holler called Cow Creek. And it was notorious for cars getting stuck going into the holler. And I had this new car, this big engine. I said, oh, it won't be any problem. We've got the Hemi engine, you know, American muscle. And um, we're out here doing the Lord's work, teaching the little kitties uh, about communications business. And so I said, we're going to be fine. And I drive, and I see the car stuck in Cow Creek, and they move to the side, a couple in the ditches, and then it's my turn. And I go, and I rev the Hemi engine, and I get stuck at the bottom of Cow Creek. So but that's not the moral of the story. Here's where the story gets interesting. A station wagon pulls up behind me. It's dark of night. Snow, uh, you know, snow as big as you know, cornflakes. And I see this guy with a rebel flag on his baseball cap, tattered shorts, and flip flops. I'm like, oh, hell, now I got to fight. <laughs> and so I turned to the boys. They were all seven or eight years old. And I said, look, when I say run, I'm going to open the passenger door. Y'all get out, run up the hill, tell mommy to call the police. Call 911, tell them to come to Cow Creek. You got it? Yeah, Daddy. Get out the car, run up the hill, and tell Mommy to come. Call the police. <laughs> That's an important detail. 911, Cow Creek. Okay, we got it. We got it. You got it? All right, get ready. So then the guy with the hat knocks on my window. I crack the window. Can I help you? Yeah, brother, want us to push you up the hill? Wow. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> and these three guys I did not know pushed me up the hill, up Cow Creek. Mm -hmm. I will never forget that. Only thing I wish is that I had 
found a way to get their card or information so that I could send them something, thank them. Um, but that taught me not to judge a book by its cover. I think we don't spend enough time with each other. If I left you with anything tonight, it would be to do something you love with someone you don't usually do it with. What you will find is a new friend, a new brother, a new sister. And it is an amazing thing. The world is a friendly pro place. God has a sense of humor. The universe is friendly. But remember, what you're seeking is seeking you. If you're looking for challenge, you'll find it. If you're looking for bias or prejudice, you will find it. And if you're looking for love, you will find that too. And love is luxurious. Mm. Hate is a cheap date. Mm. I hope you choose love. Oh my gosh, yes. And I know you mentioned love a lot. You mentioned it a lot tonight, and I could not agree more. I, we were sharing in the green room that if, if we all just led with love, if we lead from that place, everything else will figure itself out. We don't have to have all the answers to everything else, but if we lead with love and with a sincere heart, that everything else will figure itself out. And so I love that you talk about love. I know that you are a man of love in everything you say and everything you do. I see love in the way in which you treat your beautiful wife. You guys literally like beam and radiate light and love when you two are together. So I love seeing that. Um, talk to me a little bit more about, like we know the businessman, right? And I feel like we've still just scratched the surface of all the amazing accomplishments you've, 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 you've accomplished. But talk to me a little bit about family. I know that's important to you. Talk to, me, talk to me about family. Talk to me about the love that you have for your family and how you can balance all of this and still make time for family. The work-life balance thing, I still don't think it exists, but let me hear your perspective on that. I appreciate that question. That's a fair question. I, am, um, I think I'm failing the course on required sleep. Uh, Anyone ever see his morning meds? <laughs> Anybody follow him on Facebook? <laughs> they uh, come at like 12 o'clock, uh, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm trying to get better with that. <laughs> but I, 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 for a while, I would only sleep three or four hours. Mm -hmm. And I don't like idle time. So when I'm awake, I'll, I'll go write or I'll do something or read a book. And um, and it wasn't until I realized that I was probably killing myself that I now try to get at least six to eight hours a night. But family's critically important. My parents are there for me my whole life. Mm -hmm. I had a great childhood, and so that comes across in the, in the books on, on Mr. Business. Um, each morning, my wife and I start the day with an affirmation. And we read the Daily Word, and we've done that since we've been a couple. And um, each night I post uh, what I call morning meds, which are kind of positive thoughts for the day, to get people in a frame of mind. Because what you say to yourself matters. What you say to your children matters. What you speak over people matters. And um, family is critically important. Um, I had a scare. Well, Jack and I had a scare in, in 2017. Um, uh, she had level 10 out of 10 open brain surgery. And um, she had a two aneurysms and a AVM, an anterior vascular malformation, which you don't usually find out about those until the autopsy. Um, they create aneurysms and then they rupture and you have problems. Uh, so we were in the hospital and the doctor said with her combination of factors, she had a 50-50 chance of living. Um, if she survived the surgery, she had an 80% likelihood of substantial disability and a 1% chance of going back and practicing law. They told us to prepare for eight months in the hospital and eight months at home learning to walk, talk, feed herself, use the restroom, maybe she'd learn to drive again, maybe not. And so that was a professional diagnosis. But we're people of faith, and we support each other, and we're family. 
And so I moved into the hospital and read everything I could on what was going on so that I could help the doctors and ask good questions. And we were home in two weeks. And she was back at work in four weeks and driving in five weeks. So, yeah, family's important and faith is important and showing up for each other is important. And um, I, I encourage people, um, no matter how busy you are at work, talking about the balance, you know, tell the people you love that you love them. Show up for them. Don't wait. Um, you know, tomorrow isn't promised and we didn't come here to stay. And so for me, as long as I am doing what I'm supposed to do for family, for my community, for my children, for myself, then it, it's, it's fine, it's okay. I can live with that. I can go and meet my ancestors with a comfort knowing that I did all I know how to do. And that's all any of us can do, right? None of us are perfect and we don't always get it right. I don't always get it right. Uh, for as many things as I'm good at, I can mess up some stuff too, you know, it's, it's just human nature. Um, but I do love what happens when I try. And then when I try with other people and we make something bigger, so running a big enterprise was very rewarding. And then when we created the first film, it was very rewarding, and it's something that you need a bunch of people. Any given film, you're, you're probably working with a couple hundred people, and all of a sudden it comes together, and to see it on the screen, it feels good. But one of the things, and we didn't really get into it a lot, but it's a lot of different things. So Broadway, uh, theater, um, books. Um, we also um, have a few other companies in augmented reality and technology and things like that. And I try to do several things mm -hmm. to show young people that human beings are multi-talented. Um, the guy who's on the cover of, I guess, my 12th or 13th book is a book called The Tale of the Tea. And I wrote it with, with a Jewish fellow um, whose name is Jonathan Blank. He's also a lawyer. And it was after the George Floyd murders, and uh, my wife had cleaned off a sign that had been vandalized, and it made the paper. And so Jonathan sent her a note saying, hey, I'm so proud to have you as my law partner. I saw what you did, and I'm just so proud of you. And she's like, if you like that, you should see what my husband's doing. And so she copied me on one of the emails. And he and I started going back and forth, and there was just this honest dialogue. And I said, you know, this is really good stuff. If my publisher will publish it, would you be my co-author? And he said, well, if you think they'll publish it, sure. And so 90 days later, it was like a top 25 on Amazon. And it's called Tale of the T. And the guy on the cover is a guy named Dr. George Grant. So talking about being multifaceted. So any golfers in the, in the room? Anybody play golf? Nobody plays golf? Oh, this is, oh one, one golfer, two, a couple of golfers, all right. <laughs> so it's just some, some, sometimes golfers, okay, all right, good, good enough. The point's still very valid. So I told, one of the things that, I put, that pulled Jonathan in was, um, I said, I bet you have no idea, because he was telling me, give me some of the education stuff that was left out. And I was like, I, he loves golf. I said, I bet you have no idea who invented the golf tee. He was like, no, who invented the golf tee? I was like, this black guy named George Grant. And he was like, what? Yeah, patent in 1899, the golf tee. And he was also the first black professor at Harvard and a dentist. Human beings have this capacity to be many things. And so JB and I have become brothers. I call him JB and he called me BK. And we had these golf tees made, these special ones, and we carried them from time to time to remind each other and others who will listen 
of the work that remains to be done. Mm -hmm. There's still work to do. We're, I'm, 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 I'm very concerned about the divisiveness in politics and the meanness um, when I was lobbying on the Hill and things like that. Um, I felt like you know, there was more compromise mm -hmm. and people would do things that are right for the country. What I see now is people being against stuff, not because it's good for the country, but just because the person on the other team put it forward. Mm -hmm. And that's juvenile. And so we've got to do better. And, um, and it, but it's not enough to say we got to do better. And so through my writing, our work, our philanthropy, our leaning in, we try to spread this message of love and cooperation. And um, hopefully it's, it, it's sticking. I mean, we'll need more people to help. And, uh, and it's nothing like uh, leading with example and showing up. You know, somebody says, oh, somebody should do something about it. We all have to, at times, be that somebody. Mm -hmm. No, I love that you, you talk about how we can all get involved and how you really make it more practical. Like, we can't all be the BKs of the world in terms of everything that you've accomplished, but we can do the simple things like love and be more understanding of others and be more inclusive. And, and going back to what you said previously about not judging a book by its cover. And so all of those things are practical things that everyone can do in their everyday lives. And so I like that the book really takes a deep dive into those practical things that we can all do. It's very applicable to anyone's life. So again, you guys have to read the book. I won't spoil it for you, but it's amazing. I could not put it down, seriously. Um, and so you've given us so many great nuggets, so many great insights. I would love for you to talk to maybe the little BKs and the little Jackies who are still trying to kind of find their path in their life, but even maybe the little Jackie that lives inside of us. I know you said you discovered like your real calling at 50, which shows that we're never too late to start and we can do great things with who we are and where we are and where we are in life. So I'd love for you to share any other additional nuggets that you'd like to share with, with, with the audience. Sure, yeah. um, and this will be for any of the, anybody, but particularly the young people as you set up the question. Um, as you said, you know, we've all heard you can do anything and you can be great. And those are wonderful platitudes, but they're so generic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why I call the book The Blueprint. Mm -hmm. So what I did when I had that awakening in college and changed my trajectory so much was I wrote a 60-year plan. And how I did it was I studied, I read the short version of the biography on four people I respected. Mm -hmm. And I isolated the common things that each of those four people did. All four of them had law degrees. That's why I went to law school. All of them worked in the Northeast at some point, so that's why I went to the Northeast. All of them were heavily engaged in community. So I chose community organizations as early career opportunities mm -hmm. to build a network. And what I tell young people is isolate those common things and that becomes your plan. And make sure it's important to write it down, put little boxes by the actionable steps and then do what they did. And as you get more experience, more interest, you add scaffolding to that plan. And before you know it, you're living your best life. Um, when I retired at 49 years, 348 days, it was in my plan to retire by 50. So I was a little ahead of it, but I wrote it down. I knew what I wanted to do. And based on their stories, I believed I could do it. And I was willing to do the work. I mean, God blesses all of us to turn our dreams and ideas into their tangible equivalents. Mm -hmm. But you have to have the faith, be willing to do the work, and expect the outcome. And um, you know, just to that point, so I went on vacation a few weeks ago, and I wanted to. My, my publisher was saying, you know, the blueprint's doing really well. Why don't you write the sequel? 
how soon can you have a draft? I was like, well, I could finish it next week, <laughs> you know. And so that's what I did. But you have to tell yourself that you can do it and then set aside the time to make it happen. And, um, you know, I guess we've all heard where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. and, and we hear these things, but you know, humans benefit from a, a little bit more granularity, a little bit more detail. And I think that's become the difference in my writing style and speaking style. I, I will tell you about love, um, but I'll also tell you about the lessons that I've learned. And I'll comment you know, with the granularity, or if we need to be a high strategy, 30,000 feet, we can do that too. And so I can move up and down the spectrum in that way. And then because of my creative mind, I've got you know, my right and left brain working in simpatico. And um, I bring all of that to problems that I try to solve. And uh, it's, it's worked for me. And I believe it's formulaic and can work for others. Absolutely. How many of you have a 50-year plan? <laughs> Slackers. No. <laughs> No, the first time I heard that, I thought, no way. There's no way you would have done that. But now I know you. In hindsight, I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, look my, my <laughs> wife didn't believe it either. And she, so, I, so I pulled it out of a drawer. So here it is. I mean, I know where it is. I, 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 I keep it. I still look at it. The, the funny thing is now I've got to do another 50 years. I mean, I don't know that I'll be around for that much time. But um, who knows what advances of medicine the young people in the mm -hmm. audience will create. And um, if they can keep me running, I'll, I'll, I'm in for it. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, so at some point, before the end of this year, I will write an addendum to the plan. Mm. Um, the last box on my current plan is to create the Rising Sons and Daughters Foundation mm -hmm. and provide scholarships for kids who are interested in going to college mm -hmm. and they can't find the resources in particular. Education is just so important. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our young people um, uh, don't know how talented they are. And sometimes the world tells them something different. If you're from the wrong side of the tracks mm -hmm. or you don't have um, the right kind of uh, capital in your family, you know, whether you're from Appalachia or um, Harlem, you know, there's talent, there's genius scattered throughout our species. And I tell people and say in the book that the real genius in the world is being able to see genius in others mm -hmm. and appreciating people for what they can be and what they can do. Um, I, I'm exhibit A. When people saw me, when that, when that dean of sociology said that college isn't for everybody and, and I should join the Army, I almost went through with that. And no thing against the Army. I respect servicemen. In fact, my family's full of service people, and I'm glad that I served. But his inability to see who I was was his short-sightedness, mm -hmm. not my inability. In fact, and I just sent Nikki a copy of the book, Nikki Giovanni, and Part of it, in, in the note to her, I thanked her because I told her one time that I, I thought I, I wanted to go to law school. One time. And then maybe a month later, she was having a reading of one of her books, and she was standing at the, at the entry of a room kind of like this with the uh, dean of, of English. Mm -hmm. And I walked up to go in. She says, oh, this is one of my students, B.K. Fulton, and he's going to be a great lawyer. <laughs> And what she didn't know she was saying, I didn't know if I could do it or not. I said I want to be a lawyer because I thought it sounded good and I thought that, you know, that's what you're supposed to say when you're around people. But when she said it with such conviction, it helped me to believe it. Half of the battle we're fighting with our young people, and frankly with ourselves, is do we believe that we can be as great as grandma and mom mm -hmm. told us we could, or that favorite teacher. Somebody told you you could be great. I know they did, but did you believe it? 
And did you start telling that to yourself? I tell myself something good every day. I don't care what's going on. We were in the airport stuck at Martha's Vineyard for two days. And it was an older woman. And she had been in the airport for seven hours. And she was pissed. And she said, I said, you all right, ma'am? And she said, I've just been here seven hours, and I'm just tired of it. These people don't have their stuff together, and blah, 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 blah. We were stuck because the president and the vice president had just flown onto the island, and so they wrecked everybody's travel. Um, but what I said to her, and I'm proud of what I said to her, I said, ma'am, yeah, you know, I wish it would be better. Um, but as I think about it, there's probably worse things in the world than to be stuck in an airport on vacation at Martha's Vineyard <laughs> trying to get home. I could think of far worse places to be. <laughs> and she welcomed that and received that. And it totally shifted the attitude. And all of a sudden, then her fl fl flight came up. So she was like, she thought I was an angel or something. <laughs> but, but, but at the end of the day, we all have the power to shift the way we look at things. And it can be a healing adjustment. And um, one of my favorite books, it's, it's, um, it's a bug in here, it's bothering me. Um, one of my favorite lines in the book is a woman, I forget, you know, some of you might know it when I say the words. She said that when the wind stops blowing in your direction, have enough sense to get up. I hope I have enough sense to get up and adjust my sail. Adjust my sail and keep moving. As long as you have life, you have the great gift. You're on the hook, no excuses. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't know where we go from there. I don't think we could top that. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you so much, oh my gosh. Thank you so much again for sharing your time, sharing your wisdom, your insights, and just overall positivity. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I feel lighter. I just feel much more inspired. I feel a lot lighter. I literally feel like I can go out here and just do anything. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, at this time, we're going to actually open up the floor for anyone who has any questions. I don't want to deprive you of having an opportunity to ask any burning question that you'd like to ask of BK, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Yes, please. <laughs> There's a mic, wonderful. Thank you. I don't actually have a question, but I have a comment to make. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to BK and to Jackie, because years ago, um, when I had belief in myself that I could be something that I didn't see a lot of African-American women becoming, it was a wealth advisor. And uh, when I met them, they were so gracious to me. And they've always invited me and it introduced me to people. BK said, I can't actually bank with you because I'm on the board of another bank. But um, they've always taken the time to pour into me and share their kindness and encouragement. So when he says this thing about love and being kind to others and extending that, it's true because they didn't know me. They met me through someone else, but basically kind of took me under their wing. And to this day, um, I consider them friends. We may not see each other as often, but anytime I ask them um, for advice or to do something, he will answer. And I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for the encouragement. Um, thank you for the kind words and the wisdom that you've shared with me and believing in me. And that's really all I wanted to say. And I was at another event, but I made sure I broke my neck to get here to support both of them on the stage because I consider them friends. And Holly is more like a sis to me, but <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, thank you thank for that. You. Yeah. Well, while they're getting the next question, um, is Nick Powell in here? So Nick, stand up, raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass him. So, <laughs> So when we started the, uh, a magazine and, and the company, uh, Nick came in as the co-founding editor of, of, of Soul Vision Magazine. And when my uh, publisher asked to do the sequel, which will, I'll, I'll release sometime next year, it'll be called The Blueprint Part Two, Sheroes and Heroes, uh, Nick and I are gonna write it together. And so. <laughs> 
We have time for one more question, I guess. Yes, please. Uh, when you went back and were compiling all these things from a number of years ago, did you see or learn anything new? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it probably reinforced a lot of stuff. You know, I live in this fishbowl of love and happiness. <laughs> and so when I read the book, it, it it didn't make me feel any particular kind of way. And so I wondered if people would like it at all. And then I shared it with a former roommate, and he immediately asked me to do forward for his book. And I said, well, what do you think? I mean, should I publish it? Is this like trash or is it good? He's like, is it trash? It's great. And and, and he he wouldn't like just, He's already my friend, so he wouldn't just say stuff because he wants something. And I was like, really? He's like, no, I'm not kidding, BK. This is going to help people. It's going to be good for people. And, and so I think the thing that I got out of it was that there's always a higher gear. There's always something we can learn to be patient with myself and others. Um, and so the book reinforced that for me. The other thing, and I think it's more hilarious, that reinforced that for me. So, so my wife's mom will turn 93 in December. And I'm on the board of the National Center of Women's Innovations. And we're honoring a woman who will become 93 um, in October. And so when we went to visit this woman, Dr. Gladys West, who, went, who invented GPS, she's from Dinwiddie, Virginia, lives near Fredericksburg, still alive, um, PhD from Virginia Tech, so my alma mater. And as I called the president, you know the person that invented GPS went to Virginia Tech. He had no idea. <laughs> so we, we went to see her, and she says, I know you guys. And I'm thinking she's having a senior moment or straight up cray cray, you know. And, uh, but I was polite. And I was like, well, I don't know. I think this is our first time meeting, blah, blah, blah. And then we leave and we call Jackie's mom and say, you know, we saw Dr. West today and she thinks she knows the family. Her mom's like, yeah, isn't that the GPS lady? And wasn't she at the thing when your dad got an award in 2018? And we were like, these old people are tripping. <laughs> no, mother-in-law, that is not the case. Um, and she was like, OK, I could be wrong. And then we found the flyer, Gladys West and the Honorable William T. Stone. The 93-year-olds had remembered something that the young folk had totally forgotten. So the lesson there was don't be a smarty pants, you know. <laughs> the other thing that was a lesson, it was a subtle lesson, is that when we pushed back on mother-in-law, she didn't, I'm right, I know I saw her. She was like, okay, I could have been wrong, and moved on. It's no big deal. When you get to a place where you don't have to be right, or you don't have to get credit, you don't have to be the one in charge. It's liberating. It is absolutely liberating. In fact, I think you come up with some of your better ideas because you've relinquished your proximity to power. You know, proximity to power is in proportion, I think, to our willingness to let it go. And in that instance, this wonderful 93-year-old woman reminded me that I don't have to be right. If I have a point of view based on a learned experience and I share it, and some people will embrace it and some people won't, but keep going. All of us have a message to share, and some people will hear it different ways at different times. The other thing that reading the book has caused me to do is to go back and reread some things that I read when I was a younger person and didn't have the wisdom, 
that I have now. And so I read it with a different lens, and I learn a different set of lessons. Um, you know, we can all be highly trained or not, but we shouldn't confuse education with wisdom. Wisdom comes through experience and learning and taking time with something and spending time with something. And you get to a place where you become the expert and you can pass it on and teach others. And um, I think one of the things that I learned from the book on Einstein, the 93-year-old women who you know, had better memory than me, um, the friend who said a book that I wrote that I thought was just okay was better than okay, is that, you know, I'm enough. Each of us is enough, you know. And the sooner we're able to get out of our own way, the faster we become who God made us to be. Oh my goodness. Definitely deserves a round of applause. I think we have another question. Yes, my question is, uh, you spoke about the challenges you had as a student. What would you consider one of your greatest failures, either professionally or personally, and what did you learn from it? Okay, interesting question. Um, you, probably, you might be a little surprised by my answer, because I, I get that question sometimes. And I tell people, because I'm not one that focuses on failure, I don't think much about what I'm failing at. You know, I, I, I probably failed at a bunch of stuff. I mean, I got an F in human sexual, or a D in human sexual development. That was pretty much a failure. Um, I went and took it over and got a B plus after I realized that if you actually go to class and read the books, um, you can do a lot better. Uh, so that was probably one. Um, I think, um, I think instead, what I taught myself to do was to focus on where I was heading and who had been there. I think the school of thought that tells people to identify a whole bunch of failings, I think it's flawed. I think you can spend time, you know, in the analytical world it's called create, craft the problem statement. And there's an emerging body of work in, in psychology about you know, the, the, the positive case. And so it's who's built a skyscraper? How do we build a skyscraper? What we used to do was say, well, what have been the projects that failed and why did they fail? Now let's try not to repeat those things. And I guess that's one way to get at it. I mean, that's how we used to do it. But I find, bless you, I find if you want to have this accelerated experience, why would I study failure when I can study success? And so I just identify what I'm trying to do. When I started my film company, so we're the first independent film company to, to release four feature films in our first year. Our first film had Tay Diggs, um, George Lopez, Luke Hemsworth, <laughs> and John Cusack, and premiered in theaters. And friends were like, oh, I saw your movie in theaters, and, 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 and it had real actors in it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, well, that's kind of what happens when you make real movies. <laughs> and, um, and they said, well, how'd you do that? You never made movies before. I was like, yeah, but the guy who worked with Spike Lee made movies before, and I recruited him to be on the team. The guy who worked with Martin Scorsese made movies before, and I recruited him to be on the team. So I surrounded myself with people who had done it before and surrounded myself with um, friends who believed in me. And we did four movies in our first year. And so I think if I had analyzed the multitude of ways it could go wrong, then I probably would have gotten stuck. Or it would have taken longer to do the work that I end up doing. And so, you know, I definitely appreciate that, you know, people are often asked to do that sort of thing. What was your biggest failure or whatever? But really, I mean, I'd have to search for that. Um, 
And I strongly encourage, you know, a focus on where you're trying to go and who's done it before and use that as your lever. Um, but either way, you learn. So as long as you're learning, I think it's a net positive. <laughs> yeah. Let's do a, one. Oh, go ahead. No. no. Was there another question out there? Any more? One more. Somebody's got a burning question. Yeah, she's oh. got one. Right here. Okay, so this is kind of a deep question. Um, do you have any dirt on Samuel L. Jackson or Uma Thurman? <laughs> <laughs> just anything we good? All know. Or just uh, couple things. More on Samuel than Uma. Th there is a camera at the back of the room. I just want to point that out <laughs> I, I, to everyone. I, I, I appreciate that, and that is duly noted. Uh, Uma is very precise and she's kind of a perfectionist and so in the film business I'm like I'm one to tell her but it's important to get your what's called key art your posters and things out there so you can begin to create demand for the film the advertising all that we got the poster for the kill room which comes out on September 28th in like, I don't know, 500 theaters, and then internationally on the, on the 30th. And we just got the poster like two weeks ago because she didn't like the way it looked and how she looked. I'm like, oh, my, really? So, but that has worked for her brand, and so we do have a poster now. We've got a trailer now, so at least we can now put that out. When, since the strike has happened, uh, she and Sam won't be able to promote the film unless the strike is over. Mm. So, you know, having it out earlier would have been better, but we're going to go with the flow. Uh, so that's Uma, very precise, but that, that's not a bad thing, I don't think. Uh, Samuel has a potty mouth. <laughs> and we know, we know about this, but, the, but the, the Kill Room got an R rating because he just couldn't help himself dropping F-bombs. <laughs> And so once you do two, then the Motion Picture Association gives you an R rating. And uh, there's more than two. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing with Sam, um, and he was brilliant and, no and actually nominated for a Tony for the piano lesson, which he was also in, um, is he's also a bit of a perfectionist. He's really good, and also often he can do stuff in one take. But there's this one film, it wasn't my film, but it was an attractive woman, and I guess he was enjoying kissing her. So that took 43 takes. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's a little, a little something I'm saying. But it, it was, but it wasn't him kissing her. It was the actor or the character kissing her. <laughs> That's it. We should probably end tonight. Um, there's going to be a signing out in the lobby afterwards, so please stop by if you have additional questions. But thank you so much to both of you. Just a really fascinating conversation. Thank you. <laughs>